All right, Joe. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me. Um, really what uh, ECMO Economics is for the longest time didn't um, really play. It, 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 the, the recent reimbursement changes as of uh, October, November of last year have really put this in the forefront of a lot of healthcare uh, systems across the country. Um, and so this talk, we're going to go ahead and go over the historical volumes and cases uh, and the centers that perform ECMO both nationally and internationally. Then we're going to talk about the growth that we've had uh, nationally and why the, the particular effects of that growth have really become uh, a problematic for the reimbursement. So it's, a, it's kind of a, uh, a, a rationale of why we're having these changes is because of the volumes. And we can talk about that and the reasons behind that. Um, we're going to talk about why this happened, the reimbursement change, how it happened, talk about the impact and the implications of the change in the reimbursement. We're going to talk about the pushback from uh, the professional societies. We're going to talk about uh, some of the healthcare systems pushback. We're going to take a deeper dive um, into the complexity of uh, CPT codes and DRGs surrounding ECMO. Uh, and finally, I'll probably give a, a couple of real life examples of how professional and hospital billing has changed. Uh, after this um, uh, reimbursement change it, it, this last quarter. And then there's a couple ways we can talk about how providers can actually push back and use strategies, I don't want to call loopholes, but there's workarounds to, to, to get around uh, some of the uh, reimbursement changes. And so we'll go ahead and start with the uh, first slide. Okay. Yes, you'll just tell me change slides and I'll, I'll do sure. that for you. There you go. Okay. So essentially, <laughs> ECMO utilization is at an all-time high worldwide. Uh, this is primarily due to the medical uh, technology advancement, uh, the portability of the mechanical devices uh, that are needed for ECMO, and the general ease of uh, the procedure. Namely, we can, we can put somebody on VA ECMO relatively quickly with the, uh, the new cannulas and the dilator kits, if you can get to the groins, and even with chest compressions happening, it's fairly, fairly. It's a fairly simple uh, procedure to get people on. Uh, to the right, this is a, a picture of uh, an ECMO cannulation in the Louvre uh, in uh, Paris. Um, they are on the forefront of uh, doing. They call this uh, pre-hospital system, and they call it Mo ICU, which is mobile ICU. Um, they started out just in the city of Paris, and now they've gone almost 70 mile radius uh, outside of Paris to be able to handle this. Um, I, I do have a little concerns, side note, I don't know how sterile that procedure is in that picture, but um, uh, they are doing it and they're doing it quite regularly. Um, Korea, Japan, China, all these, um, all those countries are, are, are starting to model this. And traditionally, you know that uh, the U.S. and their medical uh, technology and, and their, it's not so much the technology, but the way that they uh, approach how they handle the management of, of medicine is we're usually five to 10 years behind what Europe is doing because the regulatory uh, societies that we have with the government. And so um, in France particular, uh, 2011 to 2014, um, they established this mobile ICU where they would uh, send a mobile ICU team, which was per, uh, made up of an emergency room physician, uh, an, some sort of anesthesiologist or CRNA, and a paramedic. And this team uh, went out uh, in the field uh, to go more or less be a first responder to, to patients that went down with uh, cardiac arrest. Um, if they could not get the patient back using basic ALS and uh, drugs, that they, an eCPR team was launched 10 minutes after uh, the, the, the uh, mobile ICU team arrived. Well, they were found out in those results is they weren't getting uh, much better results than if they would have just packed the patient up and, and brought them to, back to the hospital. And so in the event, uh, 2015, they changed that model. And how they changed the model is they, they launch with the, IC, uh, the mobile ICU team a separate eCPR team it, for the uh, cardiac arrest patients. So primarily there's six people that go out into the field there's a, a, some sort of a general surgeon or a, a cardiac surgeon that goes. Uh, they add another a nurse anesthetist. They want to actually do the anesthesia. 
one to actually run the uh, ECMO machine, and they added a second uh, a second paramedic that acts as a, an extra set of hands for the cannulation um, along that. And what they found is that they increased their sur survival rate, neurologically intact, mind you, uh, from 8% to 29% in the in 2015. So the first three years that they did this, uh, they were only getting 8% eCPR, which in the U.S., that's what we're seeing too. We still see single digits um, for eCPR. But the French have now uh, got almost a 30% neurologically intact, intact people put on VA ECMO. Now, there's criteria, and we're not going to get into that. But what I was trying to lay out for this is that Pandora's box has been open on ECMO. And uh, the, the world, it, this is going to be the, this is going to be the new norm for us. Um, I, I think in, within the next two to three years, this is what you're going to be seeing in the U.S. Uh oh, oh, what happened? The, the, the reimbursement has to change. Hold on. Hey, Matt. We, next slide. We lost you just yeah. for a second. Um, can you okay. give that final thought one more time? I think we kind of lost. Did we lose him? Yeah, we did. We lost your voice. Yeah. On yeah. The, like the last 30 seconds, 10, 15 yeah, seconds. It, yeah, and, and so I guess the reason I go over this and why it's important is I think within the next two to three years, definitely within the next five years, we are going to have uh, the capability and probably being able to launch this. ECMO is actually going to be even higher because we have, uh, I, I don't know if you heard that, but the U.S., uh, they have single-digit uh, survival rates with eCPR, yeah. very much similar to what the French did in, in 2010 to 2014. Now the French are 29% on on their on on their uh, ECMO survival when they do initiate in the field. I, I just assume that we're a little bit behind the curve only because we're not aggressive, but we are going to get there. And so ECMO is not going to go away; it's just going to increase. And then I'm going to talk about why that's a problem. It's a good thing for patients, but financially we're, we're going to have to solve that problem. So next slide. So the centers, uh, this is the CMS may close Pandora's box. And the way they're going to do this is they're going to cut reimbursement and they're going to reassign reimbursement. We've already seen the very first stage of this uh, late last year. And so what you see here is a 28-year outlook, and this is from the, the ELSO database. Um, unfortunately for ELSO, uh, the database, not everybody contributes to this da database. So these are just probably some of the larger centers uh, data, but we know that ECMO has grown almost 2,000% um, in the last 28 years. This data suggests 500% in volume and nearly a 400% increase by the centers that actually do ECMO. Um, but what generally happens is as utilization of any service line in the healthcare industry goes up, reimbursement gets lowered. And the reason that is, is healthcare systems get more streamlined and efficient. And during economy of scales, um, what happens is their overhead and actual costs go down for performing the service. And CMS knows this. And so they, they tend to cut reimbursement as there's more volume. Well, as you can see, reimbursement had not been cut uh, in ECMO for quite some time. In November 2018, they made their first cuts. And we're going to see uh, that probably a lot of centers are actually going to either not perform ECMO anymore or what they're going to do is they're going to be a little more stringent on um, outcomes because there is not, there's, there is not a lot of uh, room. Uh, if, if they can't provide this service to everybody, um, they're probably going to be very selective on patient populations of who they pick. Um, and the whole idea is that, that I, I guess I need to review that the, the reimbursement is based on DRGs. And DRGs, it's a diagnosed related group, is actually it's a patient classification system. Uh, it standardizes uh, the prospective payment to the hospitals and in hopes uh, they it encourage cost containment uh, initiatives throughout the hospital setting. And the DRG usually covers all charges associated with that inpatient stay from the time to admission to discharge. So that DRG payment is for the entire uh, length of the ECMO, uh, the, the patient stay, what, whether they're on ECMO or not. Um, if they have any time that they're on ECMO through that, po uh, that hospital stay, that is the DRG that they'll utilize. So you can have multiple different uh, problems and you can submit multiple different DRGs to get reimbursed. 
However, the highest DRG gets re reimbursed at, uh, at the 100% level. And then the subsequent DRGs, they fall off pretty quickly after that. So really, there's no double dipping when it comes to multiple uh, etiologies. So if you, if you were a septic patient and you were on a ventilator uh, for two or three days, uh, that's, that's a pretty significant DRG. But if you went on ECMO, that's even a higher DRG. So the septic on the ventilator, that's going to get dropped off and the, the, because the DRG for ECMO is higher. It's a higher reimbursed payment. That one will actually get submitted uh, first. Um, so as you can see, ECMO is uh, on the rise, and it doesn't look like it's going to uh, stop. The, while, the, while there's a little dip from 2017 to 2018, it's because all the data hasn't been processed yet into 2018. This is a this is just a month and a half ago. Um, they don't they don't have all the data yet. You have 90 days to get that data in. Um, the last thing I'd like to say in the lower right hand corner, I, I know it's tough to see, but so uh, they, they suggest that there was 10,040 400 cases of ECMO in 2018. Ironically enough, CMS received almost 17,000 DRGs for ECMO. So we're just a little bit over 50% of uh, the cases are being registered in ELSO. So these numbers are, are vastly different. Um, and we know that uh, smaller centers are starting to put people more uh, on ECMO more often, maybe not by, by the volume, um, but we know that we don't, those, don't, those don't get turned into the CMS database. I'm sorry, they don't get turned into the uh, ELSO database. So these numbers are, are even more staggering if you would have the, uh, the data from CMS. Next slide. So mid-2018, a consultant group met with CMS. Um, and it, based on these meetings and the advice from the consultant group, DM, ECMO DRG codes were changed, and with it, the reimbursement for the new codes. Um, of note, only 10% of ECMO patients are over the age of 65. Um, therefore, Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement directly affects only a small percentage of the total ECMO cases. But most importantly, and I've highlighted that in the red, is uh, private health care insurance companies follow close behind with reimbursements that are tied directly to CMS. And so when CMS lowers the reimbursement for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, your contracts with Blue Cross Blue Shield, Aetna, HealthSpring, HealthSouth, all these private insurance companies, they actually are tied um, most of the time uh, with financial contracts, a percentage of what Medicare reimbursement is. So for example, Blue Cross may be 135% reimbursement of what, Medi what a Medicare pricing is. And so when Medicare slashes their prices, uh, the private companies are, are right behind them on the heels uh, on their contracts with the, with the hospital systems. And what you can see here is that the, uh, these changes are to the to the right on the right of the screen. The blue was the old uh, DRG. It was a DRG three, and if you, it was a base of 101,000. Anytime you went on ECMO, it wasn't VV, VA, peripheral, central, thoracotomy. Um, it was just a simple DRG 003. After meeting with uh, these consultants, and we'll talk about who those consultants might have been uh, a little bit later. They broke, the, they broke it into multiple DRGs. Well, central, D, uh, central ECMO with a thoracotomy and or a sternotomy still say the same, no difference. But peripheral VA and peripheral VV ECMO drastically got reduced in their reimbursement. Um, and the reason that was is that they, they felt as though that um, the utilization of peripheral ECMO, which just happens to be 89% of uh, adult ECMO, patients uh, are cannulated peripherally um, this high utilization they're really trying to uh, they're really trying to cost contain and curb uh, uh, the total outlay of resources uh, for this particular service line and so you can see where heart failure cardiac arrest VA ECMO uh, realistically um, got cut almost 80 percent now of note VA ECMO plus a PVAD and you see down below it says PVAD peripheral vent, uh, ventricular assist device, namely the impella. If you put an impella in with VA ECMO, you'll get, uh, you know, the base reimbursement is $71,000. It's very ironic that if you put an impella in while on ECMO, uh, the, the reimbursement is only about a 30% cut. Um, the, the consultants that met with CMS 
um, early to mid last year um, were from Abiomed. And so it's a little ironic that um, with, and, and there's the white papers out there that says the venting of the heart with the impella is better than a balloon pump. And, and there, that's a completely different talk. Uh, there was a, a great talk by Dr. Shaw um, from Vanderbilt at the, at the um, AMSEC meeting last weekend about venting strategies. And while there's no really perfect uh, venting strategy, um, CMS got the attention, uh, or Abiomed got the attention of CMS and, and it's it's unfortunate that uh, I think it's been like that. Um, so we'll talk about it a little bit later in the deep dive on what that really means, dollars and cents. Next slide. So the if, impact and implications. Uh, the SDS uh, estimates there's going to be a 40 to 80 percent decrease in reimbursement. Uh, and in fact. Um, they're even saying that, that uh, many of the centers, especially uh, the, the smaller centers, just won't offer that service. Now, if you think about what that means, as I talked earlier about the French study, um, now they're out to a 70-mile radius outside of Paris. They started with a smaller uh, smaller uh, footprint, and, and they've got better results, and now they're going wider with it. Well, you can imagine that if you're not within a 70-mile radius of a major medical center that does ECMO, you know, your survival rate you know, just went from 29%, and we know that's not great, but it's going to be back to single digits again if we if 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 it keeps up at this pace. Um, you can see that uh, 80 86 96% of all your respiratory cases were peripheral. Uh, 77 of all your cardiac support cases were peripheral, and very uh, the the most important thing about this is that we need to look at also how many uh, the length of stay in the hospitalization. 70 days patients were, in, uh, that was the average of all these patients that were uh, on ECMO. They only were on ECMO an average of eight days, but these are significantly large utilization, high resource utilized patients. And uh, if I get to the, if you can go to the next slide for me. You can see that all this pushback, uh, the, the professional societies have been in touch with the hospitals and the medical centers they know this and so each one of these professional societies has written a a, a very eloquent letter uh to cms to have them revisit it they're even more uh they're really more frustrated that uh that they did this uh reimbursement change mid mid-year cycle Te uh it, it very rarely uh does that does that happen with cms they usually wait for the year uh and come out with the next fiscal year of reimbursements but this was mid-year and this was unforeseen Next slide. And this is probably the best pushback uh, from the healthcare systems. Uh, I think this is the best chance they've got. So uh, these six uh, health centers combined all their financial data uh, from ECMO, and they showed that centrally cannulated patients are just marginally more expensive than peripheral cannulation patients. And because it's, it's really not so much the OR time uh, for these centrally cannulated patients, it's once again, it's the eight days on ECMO and it's a 70 day average in the hospital. So whether you're on peripheral or central, you're, you're still a sick person and you're still going to use a lot of resources. And so this is pretty compelling data that really there should not be that 80 percent uh, cut, whether you're centrally cannulated or peripheral cannulated, because it just doesn't match up in, in your uh, utilization of what the hospital charges are seeing. Next slide. And so with the CPT codes, this is also what affected uh, with the with this new reimbursement. This is a pretty complicated slide, but uh, traditionally, like I said, you had the DRG 003. Uh, it's very similar. The CPT codes were the same. Well, now the CPT codes changed as well. Now you have percutaneous, open, and sternotomy slash thoracotomy on your initiation. You have your subsequent... Uh, uh, cannula uh, repositioning uh, CPT codes, and then you've got your decannulation CPT codes, all for three, def uh, three different types of uh, ECMO uh, based on where you're cannulated. Percutaneous, open, which means a cut down, uh, cut down peripherally, and then sternotomy, of course, we all know what that is. Um, additionally, they're split up by, uh, by age bracket. They, that was always the case. But it just it just makes the coders in the hospital. This is you know this is just more complicated stuff, and the, the coding has to align with the billing 
or uh, I'm sorry, the coding has to line with all the charting and the notes taken and the description of the op note and the management note. All these things are a lot more complex and, um, and there's a lot of pushback because if they all don't line up and you send the bill, you don't get reimbursed. Next slide. And so this is this is directly from CMS, and um, I just uh, this is what correlates with that DRG. This is directly from their book, and um, this is an this is an example of what reimbursement is. Um, these are actual numbers uh, for a hospital, and you can say you can see well that hundred and one thousand number um, that was for the uh, for the CMS. That's over to the right is 163. Well, how do we get from 101 reimbursement to 163? Like I spoke about earlier, this is the this is the average of a hospital system. These are actual numbers, and so they're they have a higher level of private pay uh, or uh, uh, private insurance, I should say. And so the DRG multiplier is it may be their their patient uh, their patient population. They may have a, a payer mix that's uh, clearly better than uh, uh, the CMS and Medicare, Medicaid. Remember, only 10% of the, of the patients on ECMO are on Medicare or Medicaid. So uh, Aetna, Blue Cross Blue Shield are all paying a percentage higher than that. And then once you average out the, all the patients, so the reimbursement for the DRG for this particular hospital system of central ECMO is 163,773. Whereas if you look at the other DRGs, now that the split, every single one of those patients that were in on, on, in that in the system, they should have been in the old system would have been getting 163,000. Now they're getting an average of 50,000 for people that are on peripheral VV ECMO. They're getting $12,000 for people with peripheral ECMO uh, with mechanical support, whether it be a balloon pump or um, if they're on some sort of VAD, um, you know that that uh, that not not essentially cannulated, but if they're peripheral cannulated, if they have a VAD that for some reason uh, will either cl clot off or whatever whatever the reasoning is, uh, they're only getting twelve thousand dollars as opposed to one sixty three, and then your ECPR right the patients that come in cardiac arrest in the O R in the uh, E R, when they're perforated uh, peripherally cannulated down in the E R, the average reimbursement now is only thirteen thousand dollars for this particular hospital, uh, and so there's a big there's a hundred and fifty thousand dollar loss uh, or loss of funds that they would have received. Um, than prior to uh, October 1st, 2018. And then finally, your mechanical uh, ventilatory support. If you're uh, on for a ventilator for greater than 96 hours on peripheral ECMO, remember I talked about it would upcharge to the uh, to, to ECMO. Well, now it's because it's peripheral ECMO, it's only a $56,000 charge as opposed to the 163. Next slide. But it's funny. So here we are again. If you put an impella in, your reimbursement's 115, and uh, on 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 VA ECMO, and this would be with VV as well. Uh, so this is what the hospitals uh, uh, getting reimbursed for if they put an impella in with ECMO. Uh, the hospital, uh, this particular hospital has uh, pays twenty thousand dollars their cost for um, the impella device, and so that some of that does get passed on to the patient. Uh, but you're you're more or less putting a twenty thousand uh, dollar device in to uh, to obtain almost a, another sixty thousand dollars in reimbursement. Um, and you know we all know that a person they're not going to put this type of device in somebody that's not neurologically intact. So the patients that come from the ER uh, that are uh, VA emergently cannulated until they until they get a head scan. Uh, you know, and, and a lot of these times we don't know how long they're down. Um, they're not going to get this impella uh, put in at, at this particular hospital until uh, they can get a neuro exam. Next slide. And this is an extremely b b busy slide as well, but I just uh, the, we've talked about that far right uh, on the uh, MSDRG reimbursement, but the the middle column, which is hospital billing, this is a daily charge that the hospital receives for the management in the ICUs of ECMO. So there's, uh, an, there's an initial, uh, the very top line is the initial veno veno cannulation and, and management of that patient for that day. It's a daily charge. And then you've got the, uh, the maintenance every other day. It's the $27,000 charge. 
Then you've got uh, an initial uh, ECMO for VA ECMO. There's a $28,000 charge that goes along from the hospital side. To, uh, it's the CPT billing. And then there's a $27,000 subsequent daily charge for every day that they're on VA ECMO. None of this has changed. And I want to say uh, that this is really the only reason that uh, hospitals are actually even doing ECMO anymore. It's because they can actually offset the cost of, uh, of the, uh, the DRG cut with the CPT uh, cut. Of note, CPT uh, charges also get cut. They usually happen two to three years after the DRG. So we also need to anticipate that these are also going to be uh, in, in decline as well as far as the reimbursement numbers. And then finally, the professional billing side to your, uh, to your far left, those are, those are professional charges to the MDs. Those are uh, procedural charges, if you will. So you've got a, an ECMO uh, VV percutaneous cannulation, the top one. You've got a, um, uh, that's your initial. You've got a, um, a cut down a VV ECMO centrally is the second number. Uh, the third one is a uh, is a management, a, a repositioning of the venous uh, a venous venous ca catheter. So if they have to uh, uh, reposition a neck cannula or a groin cannula, that's a professional fee uh, charge. That, that that's at uh -oh. <clears throat> hmm. Hold on, what happened? What happened? Uh, Cart just. Now there's multiple charges with this change. Next slide. And finally, uh, the pushback from the, from the providers. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a cat and mouse game. Um, when you get these reimbursement changes, everybody, uh, you know, has to be uh, reactive. Um, a lot of the people were already uh, expecting this. Uh, this is not something that's new to cardiac surgery. Uh, over time, reimbursement for cabbages, mitral valves, aortic valves, they've all declined over the years. Um, physicians knew, you know, know that as utilization goes up, reimbursement uh, goes down. And so there was some, uh, some providers were on, the, were on the cutting edge of trying to find ways to, uh, if you will, uh, have alternative cannulation strategies and alternative management strategies to get around these reimbursement issues that we've just recently had. Uh, there's a sport model. It's an actual cut down uh, on the subclavian artery and uh, a cannulation, a peripheral cannulation in the neck uh, to get your venous access. So you can actually do a VA ECMO uh, with a cannula in the neck as your drainage cannula, and there'll be actually a cut down to the axillary artery that's actually considered central cannulation. And so you, you kind of get by with that without the sternotomy, uh, thoracotomy. They've gotten a little more descriptive and they've come out with another set that you can see uh, in that past slide I have with the CPT code. It says thoracotomy, sternotomy. Well, some of the docs will just do what they call just a, a, a sport model, which will just do a, a semi-sternotomy, a hemi-sternotomy, hemi and then they'll go ahead and sew that in centrally. It's not as invasive um, and, and you can get by with that. There's centralized venting instead of putting in the PVAD, the impella. They'll do a thoracotomy approach and put a, a, a 22 or a 20 um, vent. Uh, usually it's a small venous cannula. They'll place that either in the uh, superior pulmonary vein or they'll actually sometimes they just directly uh, vent the, uh, the apex of the heart depending on what the long-term strategy of that patient is, whether they're a VAD patient or they're going to be a, uh, a transplant. And then uh, once again, we, we've seen an uptake at Vanderbilt with our impella utilization primarily because we know that the, the $20,000 outlay is worth a $60,000 reimbursement on the back end of our ECMO patients. Finally, uh, one other strategy that they're, uh, that they're utilizing is instead of keeping patients uh, on, a, on a vent for seven to eight to 10 days uh, while on VV ECMO recovering whatever the, uh, whatever the etiology is, if they're, if they're going to look like they're gonna be on a ventilator for more than five days, we, trach, we, we get a trach consult at uh, day three, and they're usually trach by day five. A trach along with any peripheral ECMO automatically upticks uh, the, re, uh, the DRG back to that 003. So we're traching a lot more patients a lot earlier. Um, it, I wouldn't say we're traching more patients. We're just traching patients earlier 
to get that DRG charge to make sure that that's what it is. And finally, um, it's, it's all about show me the money. Uh, the, the, the hospitals are having to play this game with CMS to try to, you know, essentially uh, get their get money back. It was used to be a, a, a really big win. Cardiac surgery was a big win, big financial uh, win for any hospital system. ECMO was the same. Um, I can tell you Vanderbilt alone, uh, we, we, we estimated our numbers. If we did the same volume as we did last year, uh, as, we, as we'll do this year, we'll do this year based on that reimbursement model, we're, we're down 45% of what our profit margin was before. And, you know, that, that, that profit margin, yes, you think, oh, well, it's still, it's a really good profit margin still, but to have that at this institution, uh, your cardiac surgery, your neurosurgery, your ECMO, uh, your orthopedic, all those cash cows at this in institution have to go ahead and, you know, cover for a lot of, in a lot of the programs, and a lot of the departments that aren't cash cows or that do, that lose money. And so it, it, you have to, you can't just look at a one department or one service line and look at the net. It's the net net of the entire institution and enterprise wide. Thanks for having me, Joe. You want to go to the last slide? The last slide? Yeah, last slide. Oh, that was your last slide. I apologize, Joe. I forgot to tell you last slide, but that essentially that's what I was, that's what I'm uh, referring to is that, you know, the hospitals are screaming, you know, they, they want to show me the money and, you know, with this huge influx of, uh, you know, of, of ECMO, it's a medical onslaught. So uh, there was a, there was kind of a, uh, uh, a I want to say a, a blog and that's what they entitled ECMO. Um, it was a, uh, economically challenging medical onslaught and I thought that was pretty uh, unique uh, that that's how they uh, that they titled their blog <laughs> so uh, okay so we've got a, a bunch of questions um, let's start with John over here uh, and I know you didn't see a lot of his talk Matt but a lot of it was uh, regarding uh, O2 delivery and acute kidney injury and he he had focused a lot also on the use of phenylephrine, which I was surprised about the norep. We'll talk about that, but how phenylephrine affects it as well, and how we're how the kidney actually operates. I mean, it was a it was a hell of a of a physiology lesson, really, anatomy and physiology lesson. But it was it was targeted towards not just the kidney's functions, but how the kidney operates in the world that we put it in. So one of the questions is, someone is running an FIO2 of 100% on bypass, um, is that detrimental to the kidneys provided there's adequate blood flow? What would be the PO2 that they're running? Well, they're saying they're running an FIO2 of 100%, so they're not calling in, they're doing a question over, well, over line. Well, so. if, you're, if your setting on your blender is 100%, um, you can assume you need to know what your P, PO2 is, but I, can I would figure it's let's say 350, it's 400. probably 350, 400, maybe higher. And you should not be running PO2s, high PO2s. You should be running PO2s probably in the mid 100s. Uh, studies for many years, going way back to the 80s and 90s, show that once you get a PO2 above 200, you're basically oxidative uh, injury. Your oxygen free radicals go directly up. And I'm not quite sure how we got to the point of running 350 and 450 and 500 uh, PO2s because you can only saturate the oxygen. And, and all of us sitting here are awake, warm, active, which our patients are not. They're cold and asleep and, and paralyzed. We only have a PO2 of about 90. Mm -hmm. And our saturation is about 97 to 98%. Once you saturate the hemoglobin, everything over and above that is micro bubbles in the, in the plasma. That's what PO2 is. That's how a laboratory device works. It doesn't look at the red cell. It looks at the plasma and detects how much micro uh, oxygen bubbles are in the plasma and figures out what that's what the PO2 is. So and other than having a margin of safety above mm -hmm. uh, because we are using an artificial device, it's and not as reliable. Hello, you're on the air. Go ahead, keep talking. It's not as reliable Hold as our lungs second. are. Hold on a second. Hello? We need a margin of oxygen. We need a margin of error, which could be maybe 50 to 80 points higher than what our, our, our normal 
at rest awake adult would be. So I would say between 150 and 180. And I'm not sure what you're accomplishing over and above that. But what thing for sure is you are causing oxidative injury to the kidneys at elevated PO2s. We need to talk about that some more. That's a very good point that I, 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 I have always felt otherwise. But anyway, you're on the air. Uh, caller, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name's Kyle. I've been following y'all's uh, webinar. Uh, and I had a question for Matt. Yes. Matt, this question's uh, for you. I was wondering what's the best way to educate uh, economic decision makers on the changes of ECMO reimbursement? All right, so I, I, if I understand the question, you, you want to know how to educate um, people within your own hospital system, correct? Yes. So uh, I, it, that that that's that is really the crux of the problem uh, because change. How, so there's not only a financial change, but that has to correlate with a, a an actionable item, uh, meaning your your the provider level has to change, and the only people that are going to be able to run those numbers. You need to get your financial people, uh, whoever runs the the reports on um, you know. The way that the way that we do it is we run reports by by month on certain DRGs, and so now you've got a list of DRGs that that uh, that you you can have what CMS has given us. You run all those DRGs, and you see what your reimbursement is, and you'll see what your payer mix is, and then you'll be able to tell exactly what margins you have per DRG. Once you once you have that, and then you go back historically. And you can take it before they made this reimbursement. You can see what kind of margin uh, you know that you're left with compared to what you used to have. Then, once you get those numbers, that's when you really have to have the uh, you know unfortunately a pretty high level meeting with uh, the, uh, the the you know the CFO, the CEO, COO of the hospital, and then they have to bring in the actual MDs uh, and say you know look this is what it looks like. Um, do you have any thoughts? And that's that's kind of what we did. Um, luckily, we had a couple of the MDs that were uh, pretty ahead of the curve. They knew what this, they knew about what this was going to be like, and so they had already changed their practice uh, ahead of time to go to that sport mile to get more aggressive with the traking. But it, it, it's really tough uh, to to more or less go from what I want to call the bean counter side of the hospital and the provider side. It, it, there, although they should play well together, and they are in the same, they're all on the same team. A lot of times, their circles don't really interact at all. Wow. Well, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Good question. Thank you so much. OK, so that was very good. So Matt, Matt do you see, I mean, here we are talking about AKI. And now I know we the, the mix of the two subjects is probably a little, a little, little, little uh, uh, disjointed but nevertheless um if you have a patient who's on ecmo and then they go into aki and they're going to be in the hospital for a long time given these reimbursement challenges how is that going to affect everybody well it's it, once again um uh, uh, what i did hear of john's talk and and just a little bit of, of, a, of a, a side note on that you know the most expensive thing that we do um in the u.s as far as medical is uh, uh, ES, ESRD, an uh, end-stage renal disease. Mm. It's the dialysis. Mm. That is the number one consuming uh, uh, of economic resource in, in, in healthcare. Um, every single dialysis patient, uh, this, is, I, this, this information is a little dated, 2016 maybe, it's, it costs nearly $78,000 annually for someone to be on dialysis. And you think of how many people are on dialysis across the country. So to John's point, it, you know, we need to be concerned about this AKI because it, it is it is not an insignificant um, it's not insignificant when it comes to finances. It's not insignificant when it comes to um, when it comes to people's uh, you know outcomes and and their quality of life. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I gave a talk on on a, a similar financial implication of uh, of AKI a, a couple of years ago. And you know, someone that's on dialysis, the average lifespan once you're on end stage renal disease and you are on dialysis, it's 10 years. That's mm -hmm. average lifespan. So it doesn't matter if you're 26 or you're 76. The average is 10 years. That, that's that's uh, disconcerting 
at best. So uh, uh, getting back to this issue of, um, of, uh, of oxidative stress with the oxygenation, the PO2, if it's 0 0.003 milliliters of oxygen, I guess that's per 100 mLs of, of mm -hmm. blood, um, for your PO, for the, the, the volume per PO2, um, then 200 to 400 doesn't seem like a whole lot of volume to me. So right, that's the I whole, that's don't the, the, when you, you're get the... Well, you're talking about the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. 90% of the oxygen carried by the blood is attached to hemoglobin, 90% mm -hmm. of it. The other 3% is whatever got dissolved in the plasma. Mm -hmm. Whatever got dissolved in the plasma is what a laboratory device looks at to determine what the PO2 is. Right. So that those dissolved bubbles in the plasma, the higher your PO2 is, the larger and more of them, the bubbles there are of oxygen in the plasma. What good are those bubbles in plasma doing you? Well, they may not be doing you any good, but here's, I guess, my take on this, and, and, and uh, it's a good discussion point, but um, are they actually doing harm? In other words, you're saying they are, and I'm trying to understand how they are. So, you know, if you have a PO, if you, there's people that say you should run your FiO2 at 100% on bypass, right, I've on seen pump, that. no matter right. what, because nitrogen is an inert gas. Mm -hmm. So as you reduce it and you blend in room air, mm -hmm. you're adding nitrogen into the mix and any bubbles you do have are less likely then to be absorbed should you have any real micro micro air bubbles going on. That's their argument. Right. Um, but so, uh, you know, the, the difference in volume from 200 to 400 on a PO2 of the number of those bubbles, yes, it's double, but is 200 safe and 400 is unsafe? I mean, does that really make, it doesn't make sense to me. When you look at the amount of oxygen-free radicals generated. It's huge. It is huge. Yeah, it's huge. There, they, there's I'm going to lose a bet because of this. So well, um, I'm going to have to look this you, up. You can look it up. You it. can look it up and see. What is the number one thing that you see on TV for taking this and taking that and drinking green tea? It's reduce oxygen-free radicals. Yes. And oxidative, that's, and that's reducing us. Reducing oxidative stress. Right. And that's mm -hmm. us at PO2s of 90. Mm -hmm. We're bre they're talking about you know, people like us, when you have PO2s, the higher they go, that those oxygen of dissolved in the plasma becomes free radicals. Mm -hmm. They just escalate. Okay. And those cause inflammatory response and tissue damage. So I need to ask Matt a question regarding this. Matt, you do a lot of ECMO. And now we think we do a lot of ECMO, but you do, you do, I forgot what it was now. You had a, uh, I don't have the paper in front of me. It was a lot. Okay. You did 98. 98 but, patients in about 20,000 hours last yeah, year. 20,000, that's a lot of ECMO, but, okay? But let me, let me just interject something. If we're talking about cardiopulmonary bypass mm -hmm. on the OR, then the entire body gets that high PO2. On ECMO, peripheral cannulation, or even central, and the lungs are contributing perhaps desaturated blood, and we're mixing the two, that's different. That's a good point. That's, no, that's different, fair. because that's if you fair. draw a radial sample, if I'm sending, we all leave our FIR2 at 100% on ECMOs. No, no, you but that. that's not my and, question. That's okay. not where my, I, Because I if it gets mixed in the yes. body, and you radial is yeah. only a PO2 of 70, yeah. but you have to send 450 PO2 through your ECMO to get that, yes. then you have to get that. Yeah, I understand yeah. that, and that's fair, but that's not really what my, my, okay. my question is. So if you have a patient on ECMO who has zero LV function, cardiac function is absolutely zero, and you're cannulated uh, in the subclavian, for example, what kind of PO2 do you run on ECMO? Um, we, we'll, we actually, uh, we'll actually, we treat, we treat three things. Um, we, we treat the, uh, the S, SPO2, we look for the pulse ox, mm -hmm. um, now, when you're on VA ECMO, a lot of times you don't have uh, a, a pulse oximeter, so you have to be reliant on, on your blood gas. Um, but if you do have some pulse utility, we'll look to that. Two, we look for lactate. And three, we look for urine output. And those are, those are the clinical markers that we look uh, to make sure that we think we're, we're adequately uh, giving enough DO2 um, delivery of oxygen, you know, the, the, and, and so we don't want to, we don't want a delivery and a consumption mix, mismatch, but to John's point, 
we we have now found that we don't do 100 percent we don't do 100 percent all the time on va ecmo because of the reasons john's talking about okay. uh, we will we'll we'll have uh 90 percent 80 percent 70 percent well we we have a hard stop at 60 percent on our fio2 on va ecmos um, that's our hard stop without a, a, a consult from a, a physician. A perfusion won't go below that. But that would uh, depend on what your out your your FI, it, your PO2 out is, right? Yes. Well, okay, no, so. well and we don't well we don't uh, and we, we don't look what the PO2 uh, output of our ox share is. We look primarily for peripheral cannula in the groin. We look what the right radial gas is. That's mm -hmm. what that's what we're that's what we're uh, that's our that's that's our uh, sweet spot of what we look to. to dial in our FIO2. But but obviously you you know, I mean let's just hypothetically say you had true dual circulation, the lungs were yep. working well, you wouldn't want to pump uh, blood into the into the femoral artery that's going to feed the kidneys that has a PO2 of, of 40. Absolutely right, absolutely correct. So, so you do make but, sure you may not do a circuit gas, but you make sure it's red. That, yeah, well, at, well, actually, we, we will do we will do a circuit. So every time we do a, a circuit, we, every time we go down by ten percent, we get a right radial gas, and then we get a, a, an out output of what our uh, ox share is putting out. That's absolutely correct, Joe. Okay, good. So now back to back to you, John. A any concerns about using mannitol in your pump prime? Well, there's been multiple papers come out about that. If you um, uh, use mannitol in your prime. What you're doing is, when I showed the slide about you're not affecting renal blood flow, but you're affecting the hyperosmolality of the, of the filtrate that goes down the tubules. So if the osmolality that's going down the tubules is higher, you're going to reabsorb less back over into the blood, and therefore your urine output's going to be greater. You're going to have a higher amount of water output. So if you're seeking to uh, decrease third spacing, and you're gonna take more water out of the intravascular space, hoping to bring some third spacing back, then your mannitol, I think, is serving you a purpose. Mm -hmm. um, what about crystallize, because I've heard people argue that you get, you can get crystals in the, uh, in the distal tubules when you use mannitol and that it has, you know, that it can become a, a obstructive. I mean, have, is that anything you have ever seen or addressed? I haven't, I didn't study much about it, that particular topic, but that would be an interesting topic to talk about. Okay. You know, to see. What um, about you, Matt? You you have that uh, at all? Where'd Matt go? There he yeah, is. Hey, uh, okay, you're back. No, the only thing, uh, we do have, we, we do um, make, we, we do dilute our mannitol before we inject it. Um, uh, and you know, we've all seen the crystals inside the, the vials of mannitol, and I think that's what uh, people are concerned about. We, uh, we, all our mannitol comes with a filter on the lure lock, and um, I, I, I don't know much about uh, what, what's in the physiology of the kidney. I'm just, I, I know I am concerned about the crystals that I'm actually putting in. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I can keep asking, I can ask questions for like a million years. Brianna, Min, let's get you in on this conversation here. You guys have any questions for these gentlemen? Uh, I have like a comment size question for John uh, regarding his second presentation. Um, the literature you presented and that I've come across that said uh, when administering uh, phenylephrine during CPB <coughs> that it can, it affects the capillary levels even though it restores the perfusion pressures. And so um, I think the main concern of a perfusion is, is maintaining a mean pressure and so like the first thing they do when they walk into an OR is look at the mean pressure to make mm -hmm. sure everything's good. So even though many of the literature is indicating that the use of phenylephrine can decrease myocardial mitocardial mitocardial oxygen. Mitochondrial? No, that's, that's myocardial. Yes, My, myocardial. Yeah. Yes, oxygen demand decrease that and decrease um, nutrient delivery to organs, how do you think that will affect our scope of practice regarding the phenylephrine since we're now starting to focus more on AKI during CPB? Well, what we need is a better alternative. And a better alternative is vasopressin by far. I uh, spoke with nephrologists, uh, uh, pharmaco uh, ph um, pharmacists, PhD pharmacists at our hospital, and we do an awful lot of ECMO also, and I asked them this very question. We need a vasoconstrictor that's an, uh, an alpha-1 constrictor. The great thing about vasopressin, it's not an alpha-1 uh, vasoconstrictor, it's a V1. 
vasoconstrictor. Vasopressin has its own uh, receptor sites on the vasculature. And so it is less powerful, uh, less vasoconstrictive of the renal arteries. So it's a much better alternative to, to phenylephrine. And, um, you know, the, the thing would be okay if it vasoconstricted equally everywhere, right? If, if an alpha-1 vasoconstrictor like Neo vasoconstricted equally everywhere and your blood pressure was the same, it would have to find its way equally everywhere. But it's more powerful on the renals than it is in the, per, in the peripheral vasculature. So therefore, it shunts blood away from, the, away from the kidneys. And you're absolutely right. The surgeons and other people in the room want to see that map on the screen of 70, um, which is a great number to look at. But what's really happening? Where's the blood going? And as we really can see, it's not going to the renals very well. Mm -hmm. And it, it can ill afford any drop in blood pressure. Remember, the PO2 in the medulla is 20. What if you drew a blood gas on your arterial blood side and you found that your PO2 was 20? Everybody would hit the roof. That's how the medulla is. I wouldn't is. tell them. You wouldn't tell them. <laughs> but so the medulla lives at that PO2, so it has no margin for any of us to decrease a delivery of oxygen to the, to the kidneys. There's just no margin of error. And we probably push that envelope every day. That's just know? fascinating. Yeah. Min? So, um, like, with all the research and studies that you've, you know, done with the renos and um, relating it to cardiopulmonary bypass, is there anything specific or key things that you look for that you didn't look for or, or would use in your scope of practice daily now for, you know, preventing and uh, making sure that, you know, the patients don't, you know, get AKI? AKI? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is... Um, have people do some more research. These are four articles that I found. There's not a whole lot more that have been done that show that delivery of oxygen is what's important. There are an awful lot of perfusionists that I spoke to that said, oh yeah, delivery of oxygen is what's important, not blood pressure. But then they go back to work the next day and I'm not sure they're, they're doing a whole lot different. Mm -hmm. um, their subject is so vast. Mm -hmm. There's so much we could study about it. Um, I think if we can tone down the rhetoric that it's all about blood pressure, uh, and it's more about delivery of oxygen. Um, and if we could actually have a way to continually monitor the delivery of oxygen that we're sending, because if you do have uh, a low hemoglobin, that can be made up for in blood flow. Just right. look at the delivery of oxygen calculation. Mm -hmm. If you did have a low PO2 or a low saturation, that could be made up with a higher hemoglobin and a higher blood flow, right? So your total delivery is four components are, are there, right? So you can have something go low, like if you do happen to hemodilute your patient for some reason by accident, uh, you used a lot of crystalloid cardioplegia or something, and your hemoglobin dropped, well maybe you need to turn your blood flow up for a while until you hemoconcentrate that off and get back down. And a live continuous monitor of DO2 would show us what's going on with that. So that's where I think we're the next paradigm, which was the first uh, slide that I said, is where perfusionists really need to be looking is what are we delivering? Because that's the, that's the business we're in. Mm -hmm. And how do we actually measure what we're delivering? Which brings me to this point, is on the, um, on the, on the pressure, okay? So you had mentioned several things. Levofed, which is amazing to me, you said was better to, in protecting renal blood flow than was neosinephrine. And if, if I heard correctly, is that correct? Yes, but not by much. Not by much, okay, because, yeah. you know, we've always heard leave a fed, leave them dead. You know, that's kind of been the, mm -hmm. you know, it, and if you, once you get up to 28 mics of leave a fed, uh, yeah. you've got a, a predicted 100% mortality. It's if, a, it has to, if it stays there for any duration. It's a powerful alpha vasoconstrictor, and it's going to do a lot of similar things as, as Neo is going to so, do. Yeah. So yeah. getting the leave a fed and the Neo down, mm -hmm. if you have a patient, get to the ICU on ECMO, get the flow up as high as you can, but get those down preferentially over and keep the vasopressin up, mm -hmm. is what you're saying is a mm -hmm. much better alternative to managing the blood pressure. Matt, do you see that too? And Matt, I have a question for you. Uh, no, how, please, how, go ahead. How much um, uh, uh, limb uh, malperfusion do you see? Cold fingers and toes? How, how frequent do you think you see that? Because we see it very often in ECMO. Well, so initially, uh, I don't know if it, it, which which com, comes first. Is it your limbs? Is it your right. is your you know fingers and toes ischemia? Is that because of low cardiac output right. prior to ECMO? Right. Because uh, essentially, when we first go on ECMO, it, it, I'm I, I'm right like what you said. 
I'm wanting to get my flows up. And, you know, all of a sudden, because a lot of the times they are on these rocket fuel drips when you first put them on, uh, you know, you've got pressures, you know, systolics in the 130s means over 100. And, you know, it's it's almost imperative that you actually get the those drips down. And, you know, our, our nursing uh, colleague cohorts, you know, when they're managing their patients in the ICU, ECMO is a completely different beast. You can control their cardiac output. So um, I want to say in the outside hospitals that when we go pick patients up, we do see a lot more of uh, the, the, you know, the purple or the black digits day three, day four. Um, but really in our ICUs, we make a really concerted effort to actually get, get everything off and we'll actually tolerate a lower blood pressure uh, mm -hmm. for the exact same reasons. Um, there's a, a connect system, uh, Levanova has a connect system that does a continuous DO2. Uh, we don't utilize it. Uh, we've looked at it. It's just the finances of it are, are really tough, but that's, that, that's exactly what, uh, what we do. Uh, it's, uh, Bob Groom uh, out of uh, Maine mm -hmm. has a really good paper on the DO2 and perfusion. I think he's, it's published in, uh, in perfusion the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I reviewed that article. It's an excellent article. And yeah. the, the thing about whether it's low cardiac output or the rocket fuel that they're on, well, if you take a patient that has low cardiac output, which is the reason we put them on ECMO, well, enter in ECMO, now you no longer have a poor cardiac output because we can control that. So now we need to, what do we normally do? We go on ECMO, we immediately decrease the ventilator, right, to decrease barotrauma. Well, we also should immediately decrease the drips, especially the vasoconstrictors. I see patients on a dozen drips, five of them might, have, might be an alpha-1 component. And we need to turn those down because now we're able to control and immediately correct the poor cardiac output. So we should be opening these patients up right away as far as their cold digits is concerned because you know once that starts, it's almost invariable that it's gonna to continue to get worse. So if we can immediately open them up by reducing the alpha-1 vasoconstriction and increase our blood flow. So what you guys are doing is, is what I'm, I'll be pushing for as well, wherever I go. I don't see that you know, necessarily all that often either. Yeah, that's, 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 I think, very true. Are you guys using, because one of the things we have as an issue, and Brianna and, and Min, please chime in on this, is that a lot of times we just simply don't have enough flow mm -hmm. to accomplish all of this. So how mm -hmm. often are you guys doing exotic cannulation, VVA, VAA, you know, VVAA, you know, in order to achieve the flows that, really you need all and the, the drainage you need all the time so you're all doing this frequently we, we put in additional venous cannulas right away matt yep uh, uh, we will uh we don't necessarily put in additional cannulas uh uh going uh, during like va ecmo but our uh if uh what we will do is we will put we'll go to vav because if we can't if we can't, if the lungs are, are continue uh, to eject okay, yeah, and the lungs go bad, you know, 24, 48 hours later for whatever the reason, whether it was fluid overload, whether it's a, a SERS uh, effect to the oxygenator and, and they go white it out. Many times we'll, we'll take a quarter inch line off the back of our oxygenator and we'll feed it back into a Mac line. Or if they don't have a, a large uh, bore uh, line, uh, we'll go ahead and put it back, uh, it, it, we'll put a, a Femplex cannula in the IJ. And so we'll run VAV um, a lot of times. Um, we, okay. we tend to try to tank up our patients with volume the first 48 hours uh, to, to do exactly what John says. We don't mind if they open it. We want them to open up. We want that acid. We want all that to wash out. We want to get good perfusion distally uh, to all, you know, good perfusion everywhere. And if we have to tank them up, to do that, we will do that because we know that uh, many times ECMO is not a short. We're not we're not turning people around in 24 hours. It, you know, it's it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. So we'll tank them up, get every, get everything washed out, get all the tissues good and perfused, and then over a period of the next two to three days, usually on day two, day three, we'll start uh, you know diuresing them either with CRT or if their kidneys you know are functioning well, uh, you know we'll really push uh, you know. Uh, You'll, we'll use diaril, we'll use Lasix, um, you know, to, to get the volume back off of them. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now, something that you said is about, you mentioned it, 
is uh, a pulse that'll flow, but also back to this issue of pressure. So a lot of, if you, if you talk to the folks that use uh, TCD, which also Bob Groom was a big advocate of that in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, and uh, everybody thought he was crazy, including me, but he ended up being right. But you have a capillary opening pressure, particularly mm -hmm. in the brain. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, I don't care how much flow you have, if you don't have enough of a pressure head mm -hmm. to open that up, you're going to end up with a stroke. So we save the kidneys and we have a vegetable patient. So what do, how do we address this? Well, we, we need to have a line in the sand for pressure as well. You know, Even though blood pressure is not part of the delivery of oxygen equation, you need pressure to, to drive blood to microvasculature. You know? And um, do we know what the minimum driving pressure would be? Uh, I don't know, do we, do we or not? I don't know. We've well, without measuring, without measuring yeah. the TCD, without measuring uh, Doppler looking at the middle cerebral right. artery, I don't think we ever really know if right. we're actually perfusing the brain. I, I know, I know the, um, the NEARS is not a perfect device or those uh, saturation monitors are not perfect, but I'm a kind of an advocate of putting that on four different locations in the body on someone in ECMO. One on the head, the right arm, the left arm, and whatever limb is cannulated. And if you see, you, you may not be able to live and die by the actual number, but you can be pretty confident about a trend that changes. Really? And we've seen where we had a patient who got turned, he was essentially cannulated, he got turned, and as he came back, the nears in his right arm dropped way off, way off, 10, 20 points, because the cannula became malpositioned, it turned inside the aorta. Wow. And his right side was much malperfused. And um, so that's a reason why if you have one on the head and right arm, left arm, and whatever l leg is cannulated, you can learn a lot from, from the nears. The natural numbers are placement dependent, how much adipose tissue the patient has, uh, you know, yeah, the actual number. But if you get them on there in a good spot and you get your baseline numbers and you start seeing changes, we're on bypass, we're perfusing the patient. We should not have areas that are malperfused. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So if something goes wrong, maybe we had a clot embolus, the cannula position changed, we should be able to see that. And Con I, venous I, congestion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the near pump, especially when they pick the heart up, right. or even on a circ graft on pump when we have our venous return go down. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, now I feel bad, all those cases that I've done where they pick the heart up and I've just accepted a low flow, and well, you do. For how long, you know, and what? But what do you do? You know, that was one of the risk factors. If you noticed on uh, the perioperative list, was venous congestion. I was, was one way north, down on the right or the bottom. Um, we don't, you know, we don't live in an isolated world. We have so many multifactorials, and we're working with our partners in the OR, right, that have to do their job as well. Sure. And so, yeah, you got to uh, get the grafts done. You can't just well, leave the arteriotomy open or don't graft it because you can't. You can't tolerate the, the low flow or, uh, at the time or, or poor venous return at the time. My thought would be if we were living and dying by delivery of oxygen and all of a sudden the surgeon turns the heart over, we could say, hey, our delivery of oxygen just dropped below the threshold of what we know being safe, as opposed to saying, well, I just can't flow. You know, that's right. But what now you have mean? a concrete yes. thing that you're giving a global delivery of oxygen to the entire body that is now below a known threshold that is going to cause some problem, at least to the kidney room. That, so that's, that's why I think that's why I think we if we could have a way uh, to live real time monitor delivery of oxygen leaving our arterial line, we might learn something about if we if we could measure it in various locations. It could help, because but at least you can have DO two great here, mm -hmm. but crummy there, right? So we you, you, it does have to be there can't be one single place. Now we can give them obviously this is what's coming out of the arterial cannula, right. so that's right. really what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. here. Okay. Well, there was one study that that took that took a Swan Gans catheter and put it into the into the renal vein, and sampled throughout bypass on animals though renal vein oxygen saturation, and learned an awful lot about this delivery of oxygen factor. That as we begin to go below a certain threshold, the renal vein extraction of oxygen goes way way up. You did so, read a lot of papers so about this. So you do and know. you remembered it, too. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what's that's even, surprising. That's the part that's surprising me. Exactly, that's more impressive. Because I can't remember that. Um, is there a chip in there that I don't see? <laughs> yeah, right. I, I think maybe there might be. So you also talked about pulsatility. If you talk to any of the surgeons who are heavily involved in the Total Artificial Heart Project, 
-hmm. They are all continuous flow pumps mm -hmm. because that is the most, the least likely to fall apart mm -hmm. um, over time. More mm -hmm. reliable, more durability, greater durability. What? Oh, I'm getting told we're running out of time. We're just a few more minutes. We're going to run a little over. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, so how do you address that since you said that pulsatility really mattered with renal blood flow? Well, that's been around for 40 or 50 years, and there's probably more papers that say the kidneys are more sensitive to pulsatility than not. But why do we get away with non-pulsatility, even on ECMO or on long-term cardiac assist devices? The reason we get away, away with it is because on the capillary level, there's no pulsatility. It's continuous. That's probably the reason we get away with it. Mm -hmm. But the body has been conditioned for pulsatility since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. The first thing that happens inside the womb on week three is there's a pulsatility flow that begins to happen. So there was no anticipation that we were going to go on perfusion with a non-pulsatile flow in the evolution. So it does want and need a pulsatility. But fortunately, because at the capillary level, it's a, it's a consistent flow without pulse. That's my theory as to why we get away with it. So what do you think about pumps that, that, that purport to provide a pulse? Anybody want to jump in on that idea? Well, yeah, if you ever have micro- Do you really think they're of value, the well, little teeny pulse wave you get yeah. from uh, the pump? I mean, Matt, Min, Well, I, I, think, I, I think if you have a filter, you know, if you have a filter, uh, an arterial filter on, in between where your pump is, and you know where you're pumping to. If you're talking about a heart lung machine, uh huh. If you're talking about a heart lung machine, uh, just the flow, the, the you know the flow vector that goes down the tubing, uh, it gets dampened through the filter, and then it gets dampened through the cannula. And you know what you're really seeing at, at the actual aorta level, even with the pulsatile pumps, uh, you know for the old heart lung machines, you weren't getting much pulsatility past that cannula tip. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know the oxygenator takes some out of it as well. If you're, but if you're talking just as a long-term, uh, you know, device, um, to John's point, I don't think I don't think you're getting I don't think you're getting the pulsatility that the native heart is used to uh, you know used to providing to the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I frankly I think that it causes more harm than good. I think you're going to damage more red blood cells. I think you're causing jetting through the cannula, you know, shear forces, shear, shear stress on the, the blood components. I think the higher risk is involved with it, with trying to generate a pulse in devices that are made out of polyvinyl chloride, polycarbonate connectors, a polycarbonate pump head, um, and a cannula tip that, you know, they call it a soft flow, but, you know, stab it in your eye and see how soft it is, you know? So I'm not so sure I agree with that whole thing, but we're going to end this up. I'm, 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 uh, they're, they're pouring vodka for me because I've been going, going too long. So to it, but I have to just read this text to you. Okay. That's all I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, Matt, and I need you to address this. I was sent a text. I won't say from who, but are you telling physicians meaning me, not you, that Abiomed is responsible for ECMO reimbursement reduction. Hearing uh, this... I, I'm not, I'm not no, saying... No. I, I haven't read the papers. No, you, I, you, I, I, I'm just, let, me, let me finish. This is just a text that came yeah. to me not from you. This has nothing to do yep. with today's program. This yep. was sent to me months ago when this all happened. So don't, feel, don't worry, it's not you. But okay. it, says, it says that they had absolutely nothing to do with it. So I, I'm confused because I was, I, you know, and you said it too, and, and I'm not trying to hold, I'm not trying to put your feet to the fire. I'm not trying to make this, yep. you know, difficult for you. But the reality is I was told that by several sources. I, I, you've heard it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard it. Mm -hmm. Many people have heard this. This is not something that I just concocted in my head. Um, and it did happen. And I don't, I understand the reason and the motivation for it, but I don't think that they should do something and then say, oh, we didn't say anything if they in fact did. Yeah, and that's why I, I, do, I didn't put that in the slide, to, uh, but the, the, I, that's why I put the letter uh, that came from ELSO and it, it, it describes in as the PVAD in parentheses, Impella. Right. That, 
that that is you know that's the device uh and it's it's, it's funny how they said uh industry consultants um uh were, were cons uh, industry industry were were the people that consulted with cms so right i i have heard the same thing joe um i don't have any you know concrete evidence that happened but there there is the undertone of that that's what that's what happened. Yes, we have no proof of that, and I would agree with that 100%. But, you know, you know what they say about medicine. You know, you know how they, the saying, where there's smoke, there's fire? Except when it comes to medicine. Where there's smoke, there's usually a raging inferno. That's kind of how I feel about this. I mean, something happened, and it just seems odd to me that, you know, if you put their device in two, all of a sudden the reimbursement goes back up to what it was. One last quick question: If I if we put a an, an L if you put a left atrial vent in transfemoral transeptal, does that also bump your reimbursement up? Uh, for what I understand, it, it has to be done through a thoracotomy for, for its central uh, okay. to be considered. And I'm not sure. I don't think we've got the information back yet whether that is actually being um, because it, it, it most of the time it has to be put in in an OR suite. Uh, this the 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 thoracotomy uh, venting, and so I'm I I believe they're considering that as central cannulation, mm. um, or you're actually you're peripherally cannulated on ECMO, but you have a central vent, and so that's considered uh, in what I understand it to be uh, the reimbursement is it's centrally cannulation. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, I think the Impella is a good device, but I think like a lot of other devices, including the Taver valve. Um, you can pick any device you want. I think that it too is going to become overutilized, um, overmarketed, and uh, I think in selected patients where it's appropriate, it's a very beneficial device, but it will end up being uh, used on patients where that might not have been the best option for them. I think we see that with a lot of things. And uh, with that, um, any other final comments from Min or Brianna? I did have one more question. Um is is there any um, specific, or this could be for you who also met, is there any specific concern for uh, like having a low hemoglobin or hematocrit for a patient um, on ECMO or on bypass that would affect, directly be directed, that, that would affect the, the kidneys? Like that, is there a concerning value that in any papers that they say that you don't want to have a hemoglobin as low as eight or seven on bypass or on ECMO? that could affect the kidneys in any way? There's been so many papers written on uh, uh, low blood pressure, low hemoglobin. I actually put that in parentheses on the slide. Mm -hmm. And um, if you just look at below hemoglobin, at some point it's going to be bad because you're decreasing your delivery of oxygen. Right, because that's part of the, the DO2. So there's been studies that said, well, let's look at delivery of oxygen. And when you decrease your hemoglobin, if you make up for it in blood flow, the effect is OK. Um, surely, I mean, I think probably, you know, you don't want to be getting too low. You don't want to get probably too much below seven or you want to stay above that. But if you, if you, again, we're knowing minute to minute, second to second, what your delivery of oxygen was. And like I said, if you diluted your patient by, you know, dropping in a liter of something and you were working on getting that off, you would see a drop in your delivery of oxygen right away. And mm -hmm. you could bring that back up by increasing flow. Or, or reconcentrating it back. So I don't know what the magic number is. You could read 100 articles and it all say something mm -hmm. a little different. Mm -hmm. You know, some advocate a very high hemoglobin, and uh, there is beneficials to hemo a benefit to hemolution, you know. But um, you could see articles anywhere from seven to nine, most of them. Now, red blood cells are our primary buffer. Right. Red blood cells are our uh, uh, greatest, uh, 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 has the greatest effect on COP. So you get your hemoglobin low enough, and uh, the next thing you know, you have all of the fluid uh, not going through the kidney and out the ureters. It's going out in the tissue, and you're mm -hmm. becoming edematous, including the kidneys, which mm -hmm. we didn't even yeah. talk about. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to get in myself in a whole lot of trouble if we don't end this. I know we've gone over. It was our first program. Matt, you have any final words before you go? No, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me, and uh, the, the program was outstanding. This was, this was a great program. Thank you, too. You were great.